My name is Emily Donegan and I work for the National Forest Monitoring Team at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Let me go right ahead and introduce you also to our first speaker, Fabio Piccinich of FAO's eLearning Academy. Over to you, Fabio. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily, uh, and welcome everyone to this webinar on forest data for climate action, uh, the importance of legal and institutional frameworks. Uh, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, I'm an instructional designer and webinars coordinator at the Fowler Learning Academy. I actually welcome all, all today on behalf of Cristina Petracchi, leader of the Fowler Learning Academy. Um, this, one, uh, this is one of the sessions of international technical webinars that belong uh, to the series that is jointly organized uh, by the Fowler Learning Academy together with the United Nations Economic and Social uh, Commission for Asia and the Pacific and with Agrinium that is here with us today. Um, the idea, as you know, uh, if you attended our previous sessions in our webinars, uh, is really that to try to promote um, the thematic areas covered uh, in uh, our 350 multilingual learning courses uh, that are available in our platforms and that are delivered for uh, free of charge as a global public good through the Fowler Learning Academy. So. I would like to invite you all after this webinar to have a look at the offering of the Fowler Learning Academy. Uh, I will come back to that and give you also a series of uh, link of all the forestry related courses during the Q&A at the end of this webinar. So for the time being, I would just like to wish you all an excellent uh, webinar and without any further ado, I give you back the floor. Emily, over to you. Thanks so much, Fabio, for the background about this webinar and the series that it's part of. Um, our next presentation will be by Rocio Condor, but before we move on, uh, we would also like to share with you the following short video on forestry and enhanced transparency. Sorry, can you confirm that you were hearing the sound? Otherwise, I will reshare it. Or yes, we yes. can play it later. So, 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 because... audio, so audio is good on, on my computer. Okay, because I received some contrast. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, 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 yes, but uh, it's not okay. uh, the problem of, uh, of the... Of okay, the I see that some people heard it, some other not. So, uh, Emily, did you hear the sound? I heard it, but yeah, perhaps... Um, we can share the link to the YouTube. Yeah. Um, maybe the, people can watch it on their own time. Actually, Sorry. Yeah. The video is actually uploaded also in the page of the of the course that we will actually share now in the in the chat. So you can also see the video later. Sorry to everyone that, that didn't manage to hear the audio there. Um, on that note, I think we can move on to the next presentation. Uh, next up, we have Rocio Condor, the lead officer for the global project CBIT Forest. 
building global capacity to increase transparency in the forest sector. She coordinates activities to make forest data more transparent and accessible in the context of the Enhanced Transparency Framework. Over to you, Rocio. Thanks, Emily. And let me start by sharing with you three key messages to introduce this webinar. Better forest data and information is needed to make policies and decisions to protect and sustainably manage forest resources. Additionally, forests play a central role in combating climate change. Therefore, given the significant potential of forest, improving the transparency of forest data within the enhanced transparency framework of the Paris Agreement is fundamental. Many countries methodologically collect, analyze, and disseminate forest-related data using a robust national forest monitoring system. Therefore, a fully functioning national forest monitoring system will allow countries to achieve multiple national goals, as well as to track progress on climate action. The institutionalization of a national forest monitoring system is a crucial to enhance country ownership and pave the way for more streamlined, sustainable, and transparent use of forest data. But how is FAO contributing then to more transparent data? CBIT Forest, a two-year global project to step up developing countries' ability to collect, analyze, and disseminate forest-related data to make forest data transparent and accessible in line with enhanced transparency framework. It aims to increase institutional and technical capacities and to boost knowledge sharing and awareness raising about the ETF, particularly in the forest sector. How? Organizing sub-regional and national virtual webinars to build capacities and enhance their national forest monitoring systems, targeting 26 countries, as well as 187 countries and territories, included as part of the global network of national correspondents for the Global Forest Resources Assessment, FRA. Strengthening network of key partners such as the UNFCCC, global forest observation initiatives, among others. Upgraded FAO global forest resource assessment, reporting and dissemination platform to make forest data open and accessible to all. New functionalities are now available since its launch in July last year. Check it out. Knowledge and training material developed, including e-learning course and massive open online courses, both in multiple languages, to enable access to knowledge about the ETF and forest. A tool developed to facilitate the assessment of gaps and needs in countries' national forest monitoring systems, including an information note for policymakers and a quick guidance for practitioners, all in multiple languages. And last but not least, outreach and sharing of case studies and best practice on transparency in the forest sector and new case studies coming up. But let me share now some updates and news in the next few slides. Our free and open e-learning course on forest and transparency under the Paris Agreement is available in four languages with digital batch certification and in PDF printable versions. Share it with your colleagues and networks. It helps understand the importance of national forest monitoring systems in meeting the transparency framework. Already more than 800 users have accessed the course from all over the world. Do not miss it. And soon Arabic and Russian versions will be available. Let me share with you the one year in numbers brochure of the CBIT forest, which has also activities and products generated in 2020. And finally, I'm excited to share with you all the new information note called legal assessment to set up and operationalize a national forest monitoring system already available in English, French, and Spanish. Thank you for your attention and please visit our webpage or write us if you have any question. Over to you, Emily. Thanks so much, Rocio, for showing off the quite impressive amount of work that's been done in just one year of project implementation so far, um, leveraging and 
integrating existing as well as new forms of data and in order to support the strengthening of forest data sharing and utilization, um, which is supported by all the work you've done on developing courses and trainings at the global level. Um, that's quite exciting. And next we hear from Francesca Felicani Robles, who's going to go into detail on legal and institutional arrangements, which are essential aspects for sustainable national forest monitoring systems, and in particular, in enhancing the transparency of forest data. Um, Francesca is a forestry officer specializing in legal matters relating to forest monitoring and Red Plus. Francesca, over to you. Good afternoon, good morning everybody and, and thank you Emily for the introduction. I'm actually very glad to be here today uh, to present some highlights of, of this very new file publication. You can see here in, on this, in the screen the, the title of this paper, which is Institutionalization of Forest Data, Establishing Legal Frameworks for Sustainable Forest Monitoring in Red Plus Countries. But before starting looking at its contents, I would like to mention very briefly that this paper is actually the result of a long process that started in 2016 when FAO was asked to provide legal assistance to forestry countries, mainly from Latin America at that time, in order to boost the national forest monitoring systems. So this paper and the lessons that are presented and in particular the country experiences are really the result of those efforts. So today we can say that we are concluding this long process with the launch of this paper, but we are still aiming to start a new one as we are really looking to engage in other countries and in regions. So here on your, on your right, you can see uh, the cover of this new file publication. Uh, it has been produced in the context of the UN Red program under which we, we operate. Uh, but thanks to uh, the contribution from Civit Forest, it will be available also in Spanish and, and French. You can see also the link to the publication under the cover. <clears throat> so today, as I was saying, we will actually look at some highlights. And first of all, uh, we will actually to understand better why legal and institutional arrangements are needed in the context of national forest monitoring system. We will then describe briefly what steps have been followed in order to develop and adopt a national forest monitoring system legal instrument. We will then also um, present some types of legal instruments or legal solutions that may be considered as appropriate in order to regulate a national forest monitoring system. And finally, but without anticipating further interventions from our panelists today, I will very briefly illustrate the case studies and the su successful uh, stories that are contained in this paper. So overall, this paper pro provides a basis for understanding the importance of institutionalizing a national forest monitoring system within each country and in particular from a legal perspective, but taking also into consideration the relevance of financial commitment, commitments and capacity building. The relevance of institutional legal frameworks associated with the national forest monitoring system are also taken into consideration by the governance principles of the voluntary guidelines on national forest monitoring. Those voluntary guidelines have been adopted by FAO in 2017 and they actually underline the relevance of the institutionalization of the national forest monitoring system by formally assigning through legal instruments, clear mandates and responsibilities to the entities that are involved in the collection, management and analysis of data, including through the adoption of adequate coordination mechanisms. So to summarize, we can say that a robustly institutionalized national forest monitoring system can help to ensure that national monitoring of forests is considered as a fundamental national and government responsibility, meaning that there is ownership. It can also ensure that data and information are consistently collected, managed, and made permanently available and analyzed over time. It can help to also retain national expertise. So to ensure that there is institutional memory, which is a precondition for further development and improvement of the system. 
And finally, among other aspects, that a clear governance structure is adopted. Overall, regulating national forest monitoring systems can also contribute to inform decision-making processes. This, as legal frameworks, can provide certainty by codifying existing uses and, and practices. But accessing forest data does not lack its challenges. Lack of trust, cost-related concerns, ambiguous institutional mandates and unclear legal frameworks are actually considered as at the root of the challenges related with data accessibility and transparency. And while informal solutions can sometimes produce some results, they're considered as unsustainable in the medium and long term. So in response to those challenges, the adoption of legal arrangements can offer part of the solution in order to guarantee that uh, there is sustainability, national ownership, financial support, and interoperability of the system. The paper also describes the stepwise approach that, that is adopted by FAO uh, in order to guide the development and adoption of legal instruments, in this case, related with national forest monitoring system. Overall, the approach is based on a systematic gap analysis of the legal framework. Secondly, it will include the development of detailed recommendations for the governments, highlighting legal barriers, weaknesses, and constraints. And thirdly, it, if there is such a need at country level, and once the legal report and the set of recommendation, recommendations will be validated by the competent national institutions in the context of consultation workshops, we will also contribute in the drafting process. The paper also contains uh, a checklist, a checklist that may help uh, countries in identifying relevant aspects and features that should be included in a national forest monitoring system legal instrument. So this checklist can facilitate the assessment of the inclusion in the legal text during the drafting process. And also it can help to clarify if further consultations are needed at the end. Overall, we do consider that involving a legal ex experts from the early phases of establishing a national forest monitoring system would help to address the relevant concerns and identify appropriate legal solutions that are tailored to the context of each very individual country. So let's now look at some types of legal instruments or, le le uh, or legal solutions that may be appropriate in order to regulate the national forest management system. So first of all, um, we, legal solutions could include um, adding a corresponding paragraph section or series of articles in the context of the national forest law or environmental law. In this case, the amendments made to the national uh, legal instrument will need to be passed by the parliament. So th this process can take quite long, quite long. It will really depend on the country context. Secondly, we could opt uh, for adopting um, a secondary legislation, such as a decree or a resolution. In this case, the process will be more expedited as the competent institution will have the authority and the mandate to adopt such instruments. And thirdly, the contracting parties may want to, to stipulate some agreements in order to regulate certain aspects related with the national forest monitoring system and in order to enhance this transparency or data accessibility, such as data sharing uh, agreements. So just here to conclude, I'm uh, showing very briefly the list of countries on your left from Latin America that uh, are included here in the paper. And we will find the full stories of those countries and in particular, the description of the processes and the contents of the related legal instrument that has been adopted. While we also present in the paper some specific aspects linked to the development of national forest monitoring system legal instruments, 
from, uh, from countries from Asia, Pacific and Africa. So uh, overall, overall, there is more to say, but uh, yeah, I will leave you with, with this very last uh, slide. And uh, I will really invite you to, to, to read the, the full paper in order to, to learn more from those country cases. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Francesca, for walking us through um, in your presentation, the paper, as well as highlighting the importance, the fundamental importance of law to enhance country ownership and to improve clarity of the roles and the functions of the different entities that are part of a national forest monitoring system. Um, you shed light on something that, at least for me, was previously somewhat fuzzy, which what well, that is, um, what institutionalization actually means in the context of forest monitoring. Um, it's obvious now to me uh, how essential this process is. Um, we definitely don't want to be repeating work um, in a few years time, but rather to ensure that what we're doing now, that we make the most of it and make sure it lasts for the future, because we really are at a critical moment now in terms of climate change and environmental destruction. And you mentioned in your presentation a number of countries as case studies and what sorts of legal instruments are being used around the world in relation to forest monitoring and the data generated. Um, and as you know, what we're focusing on in this webinar is uh, the legal and institutional arrangements around forest monitoring. And it's a complex topic, as you mentioned, because it differs so greatly from country to country, um, unlike, for example, technical advice on sampling frames, submitting national reports, for those things, guidance is available at a global level and it's widely applicable and acceptable, accepted. Whereas organizing and defining the national institutional and legal framework is something that is sort of carte blanche per each country. Um, so it very much depends on country context. And we are now going to hear from experts from two different countries. We are very happy to have here with us today, esteemed colleagues from both Colombia and Uganda. First, we're going to hear from Hector Gonzalez Rubio, technical advisor from Colombia's Institute of Hydrology, Meteorology and Environmental Studies. He's going to tell us about the work that has been done in Colombia to develop a legal and institutional framework for forest monitoring. Hector, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, hello to everybody. Um, I'm Hector Gonzalez, a technical advisor from the Hydrology, Meteorology and Environmental Studies Institute from Colombia. I'm going to share my presentation in this moment. So I would like to hear from you if you can see the presentation very well. Perfectly. Thanks, Hector. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. So thank you to FAO for this invitation from the webinar for this data for climate actions the importance of legal and institutional frameworks. And today I'm going to talk about experience and lessons learning from Colombia for the institutionalization of forest data and enhancement of national forest monitoring system. Okay, the agenda for today is going to be four, four points. The first one is about the background, second one is about regulations, the third is about advancing challenges, and the fourth corresponds with final thoughts. Okay, so about the, the grounds, I want to explain you how the national information system in Colombia is, is working out. So first of all, the environmental minister is the main government entity which administrates all the natural resources in the country. So this uh, minister uh, are confirmed with seven institutes, each one of them develop one of the components of the environmental. So first one, the EDM correspond with the Urology, Meteorology and Environmental Studies Institutes in Colombia. Second one is the Humboldt Institute, which conduct all the research about biodiversity. In Bemar, which conduct all the research about marine, oceanic, and aquatic ecosystems. The Sinchi Institute, which develop all the research in the Amazon ecosystems. And the IIAP Institutes, 
which conduct all the research in the Pacific ecosystems. Also, we have two uh, additional uh, entities, environmental entities, which correspond with the National System of Natural Parks and also the National Agency for Environmental License. So all the information of these seven uh, institutes are collected in just one unique platform which corresponds with the Colombian Environmental Information Systems. So you can get in the link and, uh, and this provide all the information about the data, environmental information and all the GB serves about uh, information and uh, GIS. Within other functions, IDEAM is the official national institute in charge of the National Forest Monitoring System and the reports related with greenhouse gases, inventory, deforestation, red plots, technical annex, biennial update report, and forest report for file. <clears throat> the institute IDEAM, so it's the main uh, entity and leader from the National Forest Monitoring System. This monitoring system this monitoring system uh, <coughs> conform in three components, the National Forest Information System, National Forest Inventory, and Forest Carbon Monitoring System. So here we have the three main components in forest information in Colombia, the National Forest Information System, which correspond with all the activities about characterization of the state, dynamics and pressure of forest ecosystem, characterization of the offer and demand for forest products, timber and not timber planning, policy regulations, methodologies and associated procedures with forest management. From the second component, forest and carbon monitoring system, we conduct here all the uh, information about forest area and change over the time, carbon stock storage in natural forests, drivers of deforestation and degradation, and greenhouse gas emissions and removals. And the third one corresponds with the National Forest Inventory. Here, we uh, we are done. We are doing all the process methodologies, protocols, and tools to generate file information analysis and dissemination of the soil, the status current and composition of the country forest, and it changes over the time. So all this information, you can get it from the National Register of Emission Conductions, which the name is Marinare. So we have a link and you can get all uh, information from these three companies. Also, these three companies are articulated with carbon monitoring, community monitoring, we have some groups from Indians, um, Black people, and, uh, uh, and people in local areas, which integrate part of the information that we can take on the field. Degradation monitoring is another process, early warnings about deforestation, forest transformation, national forest quantification, and one big platform about all the data and environmental information, which the name is the that achieve. Also, this information mm, provide all the data for the national greenhouse gas emission information system. Okay, from the regulation components, we have three main laws in Colombia. First one is the law 99 of 1993, article 17 and paragraph, paragraph 3 which um, developed one component of the regulation in Colombia about forest management, which corresponds with the decree 1600 of 1994, but with the SINA is partially regulated and the Article 2 gives directions and coordination about the environmental information system. The SINA corresponds with all the seven institutes that I explained to you at the beginning. The law 28, 2811 of 1974 corresponds with the National Code of the Environmental and Renewable Natural Resources. So all these three laws give the structure from the all activities 
in natural forests does the EDM Institute need to do in the country. We have also the decree 291 of 2004, but with the structure of EDM is modified and other provisions are enacted. So we get another functions additional about forest information. Article 14 create the subdirection of ecosystem and environmental information and the decree 1655 of 2017 defined the organization and operation of the national forest monitoring system. Establishing the organization and operation of the national forest information system, the national forest inventory and the forest and carbon monitoring system that will be part of the environmental information system for Colombia and its article 8 with the National Registry of Greenhouse Gas Emissions and the National Register of Programs and Project Actions for the Reduction of Emissions from Deforestation, Forest Degradation of Colombia in the Red and Coas Program. So the main activities of these regulations correspond that EDM is the administering and coordinating entity for all the environmental information in Colombia. The decree formalized the National Forest Information System, National Forest Inventory System, and uh, the Forest and Carbon Monitoring System instruments, all to develop the implementation and the communications in national and international records. Public nature of the information, facility of the information, methodological guidelines, and guidelines for implementation, and technical and operational support documents to develop all the information system. So this uh, decree contain these all topics to develop the activities. So first one is clear definitions and concepts, inclusion of principles, transparency and interoperability. This is we need to share all the information and it and all the information need to be free for public and private sector designation of responsibility, responsible entities, definition of functions among different entities involved, involvement of national, subnational entities and other key actors, coordinated mechanisms, governance, structure in place, integrated reporting process and methodological aspect, finance and sustainability, and alignment with national legislations. Okay, so all these activities and the decree was in, in adoption just in one year. So why it's important to regulate the three components? First, for maintaining a regulatory framework for monitoring and recording forests and greenhouse gas emission information. Two, allocation of financial recourses for its operations. And three, compliance with international agreements and national policy, environmental and forestry. So the advancing challenge, we have these four actions. National Forest Monitoring System was formalized and therefore the national resources must be appropriate for its operations. A recent policy document, COMPES 421 from 2020, highlights the decree 1655 of 2007 and his compliance. So here we have a new document, a new policy document for forest and deforestation in the country. It also confirmed the role of EDM as administrator of the system. Progress toward the consolidation of the natural, National Forest Monitory System instruments and also visible in the in red plus. And another action is finishing the National Forest Inventory. Challenge that we have, regulate the National Forest Service, implement National Ecosystem Monitory System for all the country, implement the strategy and operating regulation between the SINA and the regional environmental authorities. Here we have all the web pages and links that you can get all the information from forest management, forest monitoring and environmental information in Colombia. So this is the first one indicator of proportion of natural forest area, change in natural forest area and annual rate of deforestation graphs, report tables, and metadata for the results according to EDM's publication criteria, maps and report of EDM about forest and carbon monitoring system, contents and maps of the SIAC. This is the 
Environmental Information System from Colombia, and also contests and maps of the Indian website. So thank you very much for your attention, and this is in, in general all the activities about technical actions and regulatory uh, activities that we are implementing in our country. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hector, for the presentation, for sharing the experience, including the um, advances and, challenge and challenges of regulating national forest monitoring in Colombia, um, enabling us to see clearly how legal aspects translate from being on paper into actually monitoring and protecting forests. That was fascinating. I just wanted to remind participants before we move on to our next presentation, um, just to write your questions for our presenters in the Q&A box instead of the chat. That'll just help us find them and respond to them much more easily. Um, so now let's hear about the experience from another country, Uganda. Our next presenter is Bob Kazungu, Principal Forest Officer under the Ministry of Water and Environment of Uganda. Bob is going to talk to us about the institutionalization of forest monitoring in Uganda. Bob, thank you for being with us here today. Over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, um, I, I want to do uh, another introduction because that was uh, very good. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, depending on where you are on the globe. I'll talk about a case of the National Forest Monitoring System in Uganda. Uh, Uganda is a country in East Africa, in Africa. We refer to it, uh, it is referred to as the Pearl of Africa. Uh, the National Forest Monitoring System is organized in the, in the manner that we have a coordinating institution, and that's where I'm coming from. That is the Forestry Sector Support Department of the Ministry of Water and Environment. So we generally do overall coordination of the system, and we are responsible for sensitization of all stakeholders that are interested in understanding what is happening with uh, the National Forest Monitoring System. But we also are responsible for preparing for national reporting. Uh, like any other country, we report to different entities uh, within the country, and the National Forest Monitoring System uh, provides very useful information to report to the different entities, including the parliament, that's the leg legislature of the country, the cabinet. We even have uh, obligations to report to even our other stakeholders within the country where they, they need information. So the National Forest Monitoring System is relevant for enabling us to repair those national reports. Another institution of importance in Uganda is the National Forestry Authority, which is a semi-autonomous uh, agency or institution, which came into existence in April of 2004. The National Forest Authority uh, provides a, a delegated function from the ministry, and that is, uh, the main technical support to deliver technical outputs from within the National Forest Monitoring System. And we have specialized teams in that institution, very good at remote sensing and uh, forest inventory. We also have the other institution of importance, which is the Climate Change Department. The Climate Change Department is in charge of international reporting and it ensures coherence and the quality of the final outputs to be delivered to the UNFCCC. So the National Forest Monitoring System provides uh, forestry-related information that feeds into the requirements for reporting by Uganda to the UNFCCC, like the NDC and the BURs. We also have uh, the other institution, the District Forest Services. The District Forest Services are decongested or deconcentrated structures 
uh, in the countryside. The country is divided into what we call local governments. And within the local government, we have district forestry services. And these support the ministry, uh, my Ministry of Water and Environment, and the National Forest Authority within the field, because they're based in the field. And they support with forest inventory, they support with surveys, and also management of forest wastes. We intend to have them play a very active role in the monitoring component of the National Forest Monitoring System. For now, we are putting in place mechanisms to make sure that uh, happens. Otherwise, the monitoring now is happening uh, through the National Forest Trade Authority. But the District Forest Services should be able to, to do that actively in the future. Now, the National Forest Monitoring System operates in such a manner that although it was conceived as part of the Red Plus, just like in many other countries, it does have many other functions that look way beyond just carbon stock reporting. So it has you know, evolved into a system that can report more than just uh, carbon stock reporting. So it produces useful data on forest management, information that is useful for national reporting, land suitability uh, data and reports for restoration, and many other functions other than when some requests come through. Interestingly, the link between the Ministry and the National Forest Authority is such that, as I earlier mentioned, that the Ministry of Water and Environment through the Forestry Sector Support Department does delegate uh, function to the National Forest Authority. And we delegated the function of biomass mapping and survey at the time of uh, establishment of the National Forest Authority. And uh, we therefore continued, even when we formed the National Forest Monitoring System, to delegate NFA to produce, analyze, store data related to the forest sector at both national level and local level for different purposes, as I mentioned. So it's a, a delegated uh, function from the Ministry of the National Forest Authority. The National Forest Authority works with the District Forest Services in a manner that um, they could actually directly request the field support of the District Forest Services to collect data. But we normally, as a ministry, support the linkages between the National Forest Authority and the District Forestry Services. Because the District Forest Services report directly to another ministry, which is the Ministry of Local Government. So at ministerial level, we link with the Ministry of Local Government to ensure that the District Forest Services do collaborate effectively with the National Forestry Authority. And when data is collected, cleaned and analyzed by the National Forest Authority, the authority then communicates the reports and results both to my Ministry of Water and Environment, but also to the Climate Change Department. If it has to report for the international obligations or to deliver international uh, communications. So that's quite an interesting institutional uh, arrangement there for the delivery of the National Forest Monitoring System. There are quite a bit of challenges at the moment. Uh, one of the key challenges is that um, while we have uh, an Access to Information Act, which was instituted in 2004-2005, and also while we have internal agreements between uh, different institutions that are holding on to data, a data sharing protocol is not yet defined. And uh, that, of course, brings in uh, a sort of a, a challenge because uh, the institution sharing data uh, will benefit a lot from um, an existing data sharing protocol. So while we can collect some data, we have a lot of data out there, which is uh, held by a certain institution outside our sector. And that is a challenge. So at the moment, we are now developing the data sharing and management protocol. We are challenged by uh, 
the usual thought of how to sustain the national forest monitoring system. Staffing levels and only at about 50% in the different institutions, in the National Forest Authority, in the ministry, in the district local governments. And uh, that kind of uh, staffing gap can uh, cause a challenge in the future if we don't deal with it. Data storage issues are also uh, very significant. And at uh, the moment, we are still uh, struggling. And thanks to the CBIT Forest Project, which is going to add us some um, uh, data storage uh, equipment uh, very soon. You know very well that the volumes of data keep increasing over time. Cloud hosting services are increasingly becoming very expensive. And so we, 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 we need to, to find a mechanism. And uh, we have support from uh, the FAO, we have support from the USAID to be able to, to do cloud hosting. But also as a government, we are increasing on our servers space uh, every other year so that we are able to, you know, to store our information better. Another challenge that um, we've seen over the years since uh, late 2019 when we concluded uh, the National Forest Monitoring System is the capacity uh, building gap on needs. Every other time, there is uh, an increase in the requirement to report. And the ever-changing technological advancements are also calling for additional capacity building. And thanks to, you know, to the online uh, training opportunities that we have, uh, both by the UNFCCC, but also by the FAO e-learning uh, platform. But a lot more uh, training needs to be undertaken because many staff come on board and they need to be trained at every other moment. What are we intending to do next? Uh, when we look at the transparency framework and the requirements to, you know, to, to report against uh, the enhanced transparency framework of the UNFCCC, you realize that we need and we are continuously building capacity to handle those reporting uh, requirements. Uh, by UNFCCC against the enhanced transparency framework requirements. And therefore, uh, we believe that um, uh, as we continue to train more people in the country, more technical people in the country, we should be able to, uh, to deal with that. And that is one of the things that we are doing as the next steps for our national forest monitoring system. And we are continuing also to mobilize uh, all the data holding entities and uh, be able to define and raise profile of the need for them to share data, but also the benefits that accrue uh, because um, uh, transparency requires that somebody should be able to share information. But the question normally is as to whether they benefit anything from sharing the information with you and whether the information that they're sharing with you is actually not going to be misrepresented. So we are continuing to mobilize all those entities that have information. The other aspect that we think is important to do moving forward is to improve our legal regime for data management. At the moment, we are reviewing the Forest Policy and Act, and this delivers an opportunity for us to strengthen collaboration with data holding uh, institutions. But learning from uh, the experiences of other countries, we are also exploring the need to have a specific rule or decree or pronouncement uh, for data share. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot to you, Bob, um, for the great presentation, showcasing us the work that Uganda has done in identifying the responsibilities and functions of different entities working with forest data. Um, particularly interesting was the Access to Information Act and establishing data sharing agreements. So important, as we also learned from Francesca and Hector's presentations too. I want to say thank you to all our presenters so far, uh, Rocio, Francesca, Hector and Bob. Thank you also to all of you that have been listening. Um, I've noticed that there are plenty of questions already in the Q&A box. That's great. Keep, keep them coming because now it's time for the Q&A session. Um, I'd like to, first of all, 
pose a question to Hector, if that's okay. Uh, Hector, it was really interesting to hear about um, what the decree covers. The decree, I think, was 1655 um, that regulates the National Forest Monitoring System in Colombia. It was also interesting to learn that it took about one year for, to bring that into law. I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about the process that led to the adoption of that decree. What were the main steps? Okay, uh, thank you for the questions. So, um, the adoption of the decree star through the law uh, 164 from 1994, where the Congress of the Republic of Colombia approved the national, uh, the Unit National Framework Convention of Climate Change, the objective at which it's, uh, is to establish concentration of greenhouse effect gases in the atmosphere, a uh, level that prevent anthropogenic interference dangerous in the climate system. So then about it, the government of Colombia implemented the decree in the national development plan, the commitment of the national government and uh, state environmental entities to implement the national forest development plan, the national environmental policy and the policy to control deforestation. So I see these three um, instruments is correspond with the National Forest Development Plan, National Environmental Policy, and the policy to control deforestation. It was the, the key to um, develop the decree 1600 in order to use, manage, and conserve the forest. Thanks a lot, Hector. Thanks for explaining that. Um, my next question would be then to Bob, back to Bob. Uh, just last year, uh, Uganda became the first country in Africa to submit Red Plus results to the UNFCCC. And you did talk about um, the reporting process to the UNFCCC in your, in your presentation. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what has been the role of the organizations you told us about in your presentation in reporting internationally for example, to the UNFCCC. And on that note, what is the importance then of transparency for Uganda? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Yes, there are different uh, organizations uh, that uh, play uh, a role, a significant role in, uh, in this reporting. We have uh, uh, an expert team, which we borrow from uh, different institutions and individuals, like the National Forestry Authority, uh, which does largely the technical bit of data analysis, and uh, you know the the the, the kitchen of this of this data uh, processing. We also have the Mackay University, uh, which. Uh, experts from there are participating to provide us support in uh, synthesizing uh, all this information. So, and then uh, of course the ministry where I come from, we play the, you know, the coordination, the coordination function. And uh, so you find that each of these institutions has a specific uh, role that they bring on board. Uh, just to give an example, we play the coordination. We make sure the experts are mobilized uh, with different capacities. We ensure that uh, the reports that are coming out are uh, looked at in terms of the quality, in terms of uh, even we look at the methodology to be sure that it is consistent with the, the methodologies problem we have used in the past for the frail and others. The National Forest Authority will do you know, the cooking, the, the data that has been collected either by them or by the local governments or by other entities like the private sector that provides us information for commercial plantations, for example. And then they put all this information together. They work on the information through analysis, and then they provide an output that is required for reporting on results, like the emission factors, the activity data, uh, computations, and all these things. Then the Macquarie University comes in to say, OK, guys, uh, we know that this methodology probably would do better than this one. 
uh, or we can compare the IPCC methodologies with, with something else. So, you know, it's, it's a, so every institution has its own role that they play in making sure that by the time we deliver uh, these results to the NFCCC, uh, really there is uh, a way in agreement with each and everybody, with all the experts that we have. So that is the, the, the that is how the different organizations play uh, play a role. We have some people we bring on board as peer reviewers from the civil society organizations once in a while, just to look at the document to be sure that uh, what we are talking about is consistent with exactly what is happening in the country. So those also come in uh, at that level to provide some input into the preparation of uh, these reports or the results to the UNFCCC. In terms of transparency, I must uh, appreciate that, um, you know, the, all the different tenets of uh, uh, transparency are extremely important for reporting. For example, data that is coming in from the different institutions should be information that ideally has been uh, looked at, not only by, uh, you know, by the people from that institution, but also by somebody independent. So normally we, we ask internally, sort of like a quality control, quite assurance mechanism, we ask internally somebody to look at that information so that we are sure that it is information that is coming out. So in terms of transparency, that is very key because uh, we are sure that information that is coming in is information that uh, another eye has had a look at. And of course, we're looking forward in the future to have uh, additional people doing a review of that information internally, other than just the National Forest Authority and the people that we normally uh, work with. We can have somebody else, very independent consultant, for to have a look at it. In addition to the quality assurance uh, function that is played by the technical experts from the UNFCCC. Uh, and so in terms of transparency, again, we believe that um, uh, institutions should be able to share information. And we also, as a means of water and environment, responsible for coordinating and reporting, we should be able to, you know, to inform them of what we are going to use that information for. So transparency is extremely important because some people may not share information with you because they're not sure how you are going to make use of that information. So there should be an acknowledgement from you to, and even a disclaimer to say, this information is going to be used for such and such a purpose. Nothing more than that. And where there are confidentiality elements that come in, we should be able to express those uh, very clearly that probably this information is only up to this point. Or we should give them already finished products uh, when we are putting to rather than the road. So it is an issue of agreement between those providing the information and those. And for me, that is a key transparency element for us as a country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bob, as well, for covering, for touching on the aspect of confidentiality, which is so important, I think also, um, is related to some questions that we have in the Q&A box. So that was really great. Thank you. Um, my next question then would be to Francesca, if that's all right. Um, Francesca, mm -hmm. thanks for explaining the importance of legal and institutional frameworks um, for the sustainability as well as transparency, um, as Bob has just been talking about, of forest monitoring efforts. Um, in light of the enhanced transparency framework, are there any legal and or institutional changes that you foresee that may or could be made in countries to further facilitate transparency in the coming years? Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for, for that question. And congratulations again to, to the presenters from Ghana and Colombia for, for interventions. Um, but overall, we can say that for, for countries to increase transparency and improve access uh, to reliable forest data, as, as we said, uh, permanent institutions having clear mandates, functions, and responsibilities established by law, which will give more certainty to, to, to those uh, functions and competences, can have a, a pivotal role also in order to, to inform decision-making processes uh, and uh, to inform um, and contribute you know, to the commitments countries have made at the international level. Uh, so we, are, we have seen the example from, from Colombia where EDM has a very clear role to play, uh, but it's also relevant to establish in which way um, the functions will be coordinated, uh, you know, among EDAM and then the Ministry of Environment, 
and how the information, the data produced will inform the overall national uh, environmental uh, information system within, within the country. Um, in, type, in, in terms of instruments, secondary legislation such as a decree uh, <clears throat> can articulate those roles and responsibilities, not only at national level, but also uh, uh, between the national and the subnational levels. No? And we have seen also uh, Bob uh, fr from Uganda mentioning um, the, the, the way the, the ministry uh, delegates some functions to the National Forest Authority, but also we have seen the, the, the key role that uh, the district forest services uh, do play you know, at territorial uh, level. Uh, another example would be to stipulate uh, data sharing agreements aiming to define uh, what type of, of information uh, and under which, which conditions and among which parties, such as the owner of such data and the potential users can be shared. So uh, overall efforts, uh, I do think should be made in order to build on existing national institutions and, and capacities. Uh, but in terms of changes, we could, for example, also promote integration. So integration among forest related sectors, which uh, could uh, be reflected in a multi-sectoral coordination articulating forest, environmental and land use change uh, monitoring systems, which will of course require interoperability. And here uh, I have in mind, you know, the, the example of, of Simo Kute in the context of, of Costa Rica. Simo Kute is the, the national monitoring system, um, monitoring the, the land use change and ecosystems within the country. So in this case, the, de the development of legal and institutional arrangements can then accompany and in, encourage prog progresses in setting up the, the governance structure uh, of an integrated uh, monitoring system, while also ensuring that the appropriate uh, national institutions uh, are involved since, since the very beginning of, of the process. Uh, so so th those are uh, some of the examples. And as you use the term changes, I really want to, you know, to, to focus on that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Francesca, for explaining that. Um, my next question would be to Rocio. Uh, Rocio, you presented on what's been achieved under the CBIT forest project in one year, and there's some interest in that project in the Q&A box as well. So um, you've achieved an e-learning course, a massive open online course, case studies, articles, data sharing platform, partnerships, all in 2020, which as we all know, was a year with the unprecedented challenge of COVID-19. So quite an impressive feat. Um, and what then is planned for 2021? Thank you very much, Emily. Um, and first, uh, please let me highlight that uh, knowledge uh, material developed by CVAT Forest Project uh, will be available always in multiple languages. So everybody can access uh, to that information. And for example, the FRA reporting and dissemination platform, uh, now it's available uh, in, in four UN languages, but soon also in, in other, in, in the complete set of languages from the UN, the six languages. Uh, the e-learning course also soon will be available, as I mentioned during my presentation, in, in, uh, in other languages, uh, so Arabic and, and Russian. So we are really uh, aiming to uh, bring uh, all the knowledge material, the global knowledge material we are generating uh, um, at, uh, at different uh, levels, but also uh, in different uh, languages. We will also have a second and a third edition of a massive open online course in forest and transparency. Uh, so just follow us, uh, check our news in the webpage or write us. News, uh, new case studies from different regions will also be available in multiple languages. So I, I just say uh, stay tuned and follow us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rocio. Great. Um, then I think we, we still have plenty of time. So I would like to um, go back to Hector with another question, if that's all right. Um, impressively, Colombia is the first country in Latin America to have set up a similar legal framework enshrining its national forest monitoring work. Um, that's mean that makes Colombia really a world leader in this regard. And while obviously every country, as we also heard in Francesca's presentation, has its own unique legal system, what could be some lessons learned maybe from the experience in Colombia that 
could be of use to other countries, applicable, of course, within their own legal systems. Hector, you're on mute, just in case. Thanks. Yes, I'm uh, Well, this is, this is not a, a very uh, easy activity, you know. So here we have uh, seven institutes which all uh, have responsibilities about environmental information. And uh, also each institute are you know, working in some components of the forest, like uh, uh, all forests that are close to oceanic or aquatic uh, ecosystems, and uh, like a mangrove ecosystems, the same for uh, the institute which conduct all the biodiversity research and uh, they need to work also in some uh, measurements and also from the forest inventory about wood products and no wood products which people can use in all the, the forest management plan. So um, the the actions uh, need to incorporate and integrate all the objectives from all the different environmental institutions. So I think that um, uh, one of the main activities and lessons uh, learned from this experience was uh, a political will, a uh, political commitment. Uh, I think the national government uh, make all the uh, environmental policy, but to implement this environmental policy and specific the forest policy in each region of the country, in each uh, environmental authority in the regional areas is one of the, of the challenge in this, in this uh, uh, regulatory activities. Another one, is the priority of the national development plan. So we have a, a, a national policy, but if this policy is not into the national development plan. So that policy is not going to be implemented. So we need that each goal, each objective, each action and activity need to be included into the national development plan. So the government here in Colombia is going to be changed each four years. So we need that the national development plan will be incorporate all the political about forest management. Sorry, today there are a lot of plane traffic close to our office. Okay, and the third uh, lesson uh, is the recognition of forest as a, as a means of environmental, social, and economic sustainability. I think we need to, to determine that forest is a natural capital. So we have a very important natural resources in Colombia. We are, as you know, in tropic areas, we have a, a, a approximately 50% of our area are forests in Colombia. So we need to implement very good uh, principles, very good uh, action in order to use management and conservate all the, the forests. And we need to know that in all the forests we have uh, black people, indigenous people, and community in local areas that they depend on the forest. So we need to establish very good rules in order to use in adequate forms the forest and implement a specific criteria for the sustainability of the forest. And um, these activities need to be in the conscience and the awareness of the people. And people need to know that the forest uh, need to conserve it, but also we can use it in a, in a very good way. So I think this, this three components is the main uh, lesson that we learn from this uh, regulatory process.
Thanks so much, Hector. I think we've got time maybe for one last question. Um, I'll give it to Bob, if that's all right. Um, Bob, in your presentation, to me, one of the main takeaways, the key takeaway perhaps was on was data sharing, um, a topic that's becoming increasingly important, particularly in light of the enhanced transparency framework. Could you briefly explain why data sharing is important for Uganda? What benefits can accrue? And if relevant, what are the pitfalls to be avoided? Thank you, thank you very much. Indeed, uh, data sharing is very important for Uganda, just like it is for other countries, because um, uh, depending on with whom or for what we are sharing the data. If we look at the UNFCCC reporting, uh, that is also a data sharing of sorts, <laughs> if, if I may use that example. And when we report results, like we did report results in April 2020, when we delivered the taking off for annex to the biannual update report, We've received uh, many, many uh, requests and uh, collaborations with uh, many institutions, both private sector like Microsoft, uh, you know, to see whether we can look at the art standard. We've, we've also received a lot of other engagements with UN Red, uh, got interested in the data, in the results that we submitted. and. Uh, and right now we're working on how can we, uh, if there are any gaps with our data, how can we make sure we fix them as quickly as possible so that the country can now start benefiting from results-based payments. So that is one uh, global and major a benefit for us to be able to freely uh, share our data and allow you know, uh, experts globally to, to have a look and uh, critique where possible and uh, provide uh, an input into and ask some questions anyway, for that's part of transparency uh, about the data that uh, we've, uh, we've shared. So that is one very important, but also uh, within the country, it enhances our, you know, raises the profile of uh, the forestry sector if we're able to share information. And when we do share information freely, the people who make decisions, like the people in the parliament of Uganda, the cabinet and the others, will be able to see that there is work that is being done uh, as a country to respond to you know, the climate change uh, uh, questions or requirements for us to, to report as a country, but also nationally. Then it helps us to be able to use the same data uh, as we have used it actually to develop what we call the natural accounting, uh, capital accounting system, accounting system for forestry, for example. We used information that we had in the forestry sector, which we believe if we were hesitant to share with the experts who were computing the capital accounts, then we would have missed out on the opportunity for forestry, this contribution to the GDP, to be known by the people who make decisions in, uh, in responding to our request for financing. So. We, it has raised the, our profile in the uh, Ministry of Finance, for example, because now it knows how much exactly we make a contribution to the, the national, uh, the GDP, the gross domestic product of the country. And because of that, then we have found resources, additional resources coming to the forest sector in the recent past because of the fact that we're able to freely share the information. Emil, just remind me of the last part of the question. It was just about the pitfalls, Bob, if there's any pitfalls associated with data sharing. Uh, I think one of the, the issues which is very critical is that um, uh, we are not able to collect all the data that we need. Really, it's, um, it, it's a challenge to be able, and that's why we're looking forward to the data sharing protocol. Uh, but two, it's very expensive, much as we want to share information. But let me give an example of activity data every year. It's very expensive for us to be able to collect activity AD, activity data at annual basis. So we use um, weighted averages for a certain period, which is allowed by RPCC standards, but it's, uh, it may not give a very good, um, uh, you know, uh, especially a response to especially the person who wants to pay a coin to, you know, for the carbon uh, sequester. 
by, by Uganda. So that's some of the things that we're trying to do. So much as we want to share information very well, but there are some gaps that are actually very expensive to fix. And uh, we, we, we're trying to mobilize some resources to be able to fix some of those gaps with the data, especially annual activity data, uh, so that we're able to deliver results that you know uh, the private sector that is willing to work to, to, to engage the country to pay for you know for, to pay for results uh, will be comfortable with so those are the two main uh, main uh, elements the others are things that we were able to sort out uh, immediately internally yeah thank you very much thank you bob thanks for explaining that and giving us some illustrations and examples that makes it much easier to imagine and understand what's going what's going on. That's fantastic. Um, I think we're almost ready to wrap up. So I want to thank everyone for your engagement. Um, and hopefully we managed to answer most of the questions that were in the Q&A box. I think we've managed about two thirds. And the ones that we haven't, we will get round to all questions in a follow up, along with the recording as soon as we can. Um, I know I wanted to see if we could try and watch the video again together. There were some audio, audio problems before. Maybe we give it another go before closing. Okay, thank you everyone. I think there were still some audio problems for some people. I could hear it and some of my colleagues could, but for those that couldn't, that will be, that is available already on YouTube um, and the link to that's been shared in the chat. So uh, you can watch that on your own time. Sorry about that again though. And with that, I'm going to hand over now to Julian Fox. Julian is the team leader here at the National Forest Monitoring Team at FAO. He will give us some closing remarks. Thanks for being here today, Julian. Over to you. Thank you, Emily. And thank you so much to the panelists for the engaging presentations and discussions. And special thanks to Hector and Bob for bringing these really important country examples from Colombia and Uganda, respectively. For forest data, FAO's starting point is the Voluntary Guidelines for National Forest Monitoring, which advocates for multi-purpose NFMS. I encourage you all to use the publication and it's great to see the NFMS for Colombia and Uganda 
are truly multi-purpose. That's just wonderful. So we identified several years ago that greater attention was needed toward institutionalization of national forest monitoring systems through legal frameworks. And it is so great today that with support from UN Red and Sibit Forest, we host this webinar to highlight the topic and also launch a technical publication with guidance on how countries can address this need. And thank you so much to Francesca Falacani for being a true pioneer on this topic and helping, helping us deliver this important material today. So as has been discussed and is really clear, the institutionalization of forest data through legal frameworks is critically important. Having a national forest monitoring system legally embedded in government structures can ensure sustainability and national ownership of the system and ensures the critical multi-purpose functions it supports, such as national forest and land management decision and policy making and reporting functions such as for Red Plus and for reporting against the Enhanced Transparency Framework of the Paris Agreement. Clarified roles and responsibilities among government departments and ministries at the national level and clear data sharing agreements can ensure that national forest monitoring systems function and fulfill their critical purpose. Now it is the time to follow the guidance provided in the new publication uh, launched today and replicate the case studies and the wonderful examples provided today by Colombia and Uganda, who also outlined some of their challenges. This can ensure that our efforts are sustainable, catalytic, and enable much needed action for forests and climate. I also see two new opportunities to build on institutionalized NFMS. The first one, it is the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. It's just commenced this year, and it's really a decade of action to restore degraded ecosystems um, and prevent and halt deforestation and degradation of existing ecosystems. My team is working on a global framework for monitoring the decade, what we are calling the framework for ecosystem restoration monitoring. And our vision is that we build on existing national forest monitoring systems using existing legal and institutional frameworks for the function of restoration monitoring. I mean, restoration monitoring is a natural multi-purpose function of an NFMS. And we are working on a technical publication linking NFMS to restoration monitoring, which we hope to launch on World Environment Day on the 5th of June, which is the official launch of the UN decade. My second, op my second opportunity that's present right now is the, is the technology and innovation we see. You know, new powerful data streams becoming available. Um, one exciting example is the new high resolution monthly base maps purchased by NICFI of Norway, available for 64 tropical countries. It is important for countries to consider and explore how these new data can strengthen and contribute to elements of their existing national forest monitoring system, how they can complement the existing data sources of the NFMS and how they can be integrated into institutional structures. One clear application is to improve the spatial and temporal resolution of reference data collection, which is critical for sample-based approaches such as stratified area estimation, as well as map creation, map accuracy assessment, and for degradation monitoring. From FAO and in collaboration with technical partners, we will create some technical notes on how countries can integrate new data streams, such as the NICFI base maps into their national forest monitoring systems. In my closing comment, I would like to convey, we've, we've seen that higher levels of sustainability and transparency in forest monitoring are facilitating higher levels of ambition. And this is really exciting. I mean, our vision is that transparent, reliable, relevant, accessible and sustainable national forest monitoring systems can support climate action on the ground Continuous improvement and strengthening of these systems can support higher levels of action and ambition, which is so desperately needed at this critical moment for humanity. Thank you very much for your valuable time. Thank you again to all the presenters and have a fantastic day. Signing off from FAO. Maybe back to you, Emily, to close out. Thank you. <laughs> thanks a lot, Julian. Um, and thanks a lot, everyone, for participating today um, in what was a great session certainly in my opinion. Um, I want to thanks, thank again all our presenters, Rocio, Francesca, Bob and Hector, and also Julian. Thanks so much everyone for attending. Bye. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me just uh, give a last Bye. few words. Um, as many of you asked, uh, the recording of today's webinar together with the Q&A and all the PowerPoint presentations. Uh, will be made available at the link uh, that we provided in the chat and that we will send again via email to each of you.
Uh, so we also prepared that list of uh, all forestry related courses uh, that are free of charge, always available through the Fire Learning Academy. Uh, so we invite you to have a look. We will share the link with you again. Uh, also, the course on forest and transparency under the Paris Agreement is uh, the last one that we published also in Chinese and in other languages. So please have a look. Uh, thanks again to all of you, participants, uh, panelists. Uh, thank you very much for attending this session. Uh, we will make available the recording in the upcoming days and send it to you. Thanks a lot and wishing a good day, good evening to all of you.